in a tragic car accident. We lost one of the greatest writers, producers, and directors the cinematic medium has ever known. Alan J. Pakula might not have been a household name, but his legacy of landmark films will forever live in the hearts and minds of film lovers all across the globe. From his earliest producing efforts in To Kill a Mockingbird and Up the Down Staircase, to his paranoid trilogy of Clute, The Parallax View, and All the President's Men, all the way to stunning dramas like Sophie's Choice and powerhouse thrillers like Presumed Innocent, The Pelican Brief, and The Devil's Own, Bakula's works contain a meticulously crafted sense of detail and never fail to shed light on our capacity for both corruption and great humanity. Tonight we pay tribute to this master filmmaker whose legendary works have enriched the art form and the lives of countless cinema enthusiasts. We start with Jared Brown, the author of the first definitive biography on Alan J. Pakula, titled Alan J. Pakula, His Films and His Life. This book offers amazing insights from over 40 close collaborators, friends, and family members, including Harrison Ford, Meryl Streep, Donald Sutherland, Kevin Klein, and Jane Fonda. It is a must-read tribute to one of our great filmmakers who placed the integrity of his work far above personal notoriety. Mr. Brown is the former chair of the School of Theater Arts at Illinois Wesleyan University and has, offered, and has authored a, n- a number of plays, essays, and books, including Zero Mostel, a biography, and Theater in America during the Revolution. It is a great honor to welcome Mr. Jared Brown to our program. Mr. Brown, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We appreciate your uh, participation in this. Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, do you concur with that assessment that you know he's responsible for so many classic films but but uh, the name Alan J Pakula isn't isn't very widely known oh absolutely uh what, in fact as i was working on the book as i was researching it and writing it uh people would ask me what i was working on and i would mention the uh outstanding film director Alan J Pakula and i'd get blank stares from a lot of people and then i'd say well you've seen all the president's men right you've seen Sophie's choice you've seen Clute and they would say, do you mean he directed all those things? And I, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. So I that, think it, it pointed to the fact that um, he really wasn't um, a person who was a self-promoter. He was interested in his work. He was interested in a lot of other things, but not really so much in pushing himself. And maybe that's why his name is not as well known as it, it really ought to be. Yeah, yeah. And it's plus it, in terms of his... His style. I mean, he he made films uh, that had very provocative subject matter. Absolutely. Uh, but his style was so um, so encapsulated in capturing the reality. Uh, it it didn't call attention to itself. It was very it was it was invisible. That's how good it was. Yeah. Well, I think that was uh, partly the style that he was. Well, it was the style that he was trying to achieve. He he. Um, didn't move the camera in a fancy way, for instance, and he because he didn't want to call attention to the camera. He wanted yeah. the uh, audience's attention to be on the story that was being told, on the actors, uh, and the development of the plot, and so on. Yeah. What, so, you, for for you personally, what are what are some of your favorite Pakula films, and, and how do they speak to you? Well, I would say uh, Sophie's Choice and All the President's Men were his great masterworks. Um, I've been asked this question many times, and I, I really can't choose between those two. I just think they're both they're both great pictures. Yeah. Um, I suppose there is no stronger uh, emotional feeling that I've ever gotten from a movie than I got from Sophie's Choice. Yeah. I remember at the end of that picture when I first saw it, I, I think I was in San Francisco, and I was just stunned and um, sat there and couldn't get out of my seat when the film was over. And I noticed that I was not the only one in the theater either, that many people were, were reacting that way. It is um, uh, it's just a masterful work, I think, and uh, partly because it has great performances by Meryl Streep and by Carol, uh, Kevin Klein, And uh, everybody in the film is so good, but, but it's the overall conception and the, the brilliance that, with which everything is treated that uh, is so great about it. And then, of course, All the President's Men, which is probably better known to many people, um, also, fine performances from uh, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman and Jason Robards and others. But uh, it also, I think, um, really shed so much uh, illumination on how these young reporters at the time, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, had um, exposed this tremendous conspiracy. Mm-hmm. And um, 
contributed to the uh, resignation of a president, I think for the only time in the history of the United States, and created in the film itself such a, a mood of um, fear at certain points, um, of interest in the investigative process, which and is probably the most accurate journalistic film ever made, I would think. I think so, too, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's also, as I said, I think it's just masterful. But if those two are the best, you know, I think that uh, some of the others I heard you mention before um, are certainly very close to it. Clute, certainly. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, which he produced but did not direct. Right. Uh, presumed Innocent. Um, there, there's how, really a how can long you get list. better than how can you get better than any of those? I mean, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And and maybe a, just a step down from those would be, in my opinion, the parallax view, but very close. Right, right. Uh, but but in speaking to your uh, in speaking to all of these all of his collaborators and friends and family, uh, what surprised you most about him, and and what were some of the most common sentiments that kept popping up? Well, I'm not sure this surprised me very much, but uh, here's a common sentiment certainly that kept popping up that he was extraordinarily interested in psychology. And, in mm -hmm. fact, he had, uh, at one point in his life, before he went into the movie business, he had considered becoming a psychiatrist. Uh, he didn't, in fact, but it seems to me that that sensibility was with him always. He, his tremendous interest in the psychology of his, his characters. And I think his great interest in other people. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, when he was on an airplane, let's say, and he was sitting next to a person that he didn't know and didn't know him. And the person would ask um, in the course of the flight, uh, what do you do for a living? And Pakula would never say, I'm a movie director, because he didn't want to talk about himself. He wanted to talk about other people. Right. So he would say, I'm a psychiatrist. So, you know, tell me a little about your life. What do you do? <laughs> and um, he loved that sort of thing, getting other people involved and telling them their, telling him their story. And there, uh, his wife, Hannah, told me um, this interesting story, I think, that sh they would have dinner parties several times, and um, when people would come over, Hannah and Alan would sit at separate places on the table, and the person seated next to Alan would come over to Hannah at the end of the dinner often and say, I don't know how he did it, but Alan got everything out of me. He knows everything about me now. I told him my life story. And that's because he was really curious about other people and why they behave and the way they behave. Um, and I think that shows up in, in his pictures, that they are, they are so psychologically um, complex. Sure. I, I read an interview that he did um, years ago uh, with uh, maybe 85 with the, with the American Film Institute. And he actually spoke about you know, the role of the director as part, part psych, psychoanalyst. Right. Uh, you know, and he was very meticulous in, in, in the, the way he communicated with his actors. In, in terms of his actors and what you heard from them, what I've often heard him refer to as a perfect actor's director. What, what made that the case with him? I think the fact that he had so much respect for the actors that he was working with. As Meryl Streep pointed out, some directors find the whole um, process of making a film a messy one, especially because they have to work with these um, actors who keep getting in the way. And they just can't wait to get into the editing room where they feel the, the work, uh, they can really control their work. Right. Kula wasn't like that at all. He loved the interaction with actors. Um, in fact, that's why he became a director, as he said many times. And he, he loved to work with actors. And um, he was able to draw from them such interesting performances, I think, because he gave them such freedom. Um, they had the freedom often to improvise. Um, they certainly had the freedom to explore their characters in many different ways. And Pakula was one who liked to take many different takes. Once of uh, a scene in Sophie's Choice that he said could have been done 30 different ways. And Pakula said, well, let's see them. And they filmed many of those ways. And uh, they were pretty radically different. And... Um, Kevin Klein said, I've never, never worked with a director who let me have that kind of freedom before or since, mm. and it was just a, a fantastic luxury. He said everything in that film came from the actor's impulse, and that's what Pakula told them. He said, uh, don't worry about the camera, don't worry about the lighting, don't worry about anything, just worry about the honesty of your relationships. And um, I, I think he was able to draw that from them so often. I know that he, growing up, he, his, his father was in the printing business. Mm -hmm. 
and he was he was being looked upon to kind of take over that business. But yeah. but where did the detour take place? When when did his where did his love of films come come to play? Well, I think it started with his love of the theater. He was um, he was going to school and he directed a production of Chekhov's, and uh, for the first time he said he felt a real power in in directing the play. He said it was clear that the actors relied on him and that he had a kind of feeling for the actors and he could work with them in a in a sort of magical way. Mm-hmm. And um, he he uh, decided ultimately that he wanted to go into films, but not before he had explored the theater, both as director and producer, director on an amateur level, producer on a professional level. Um, so he began by going out to um, California with his father's permission and, some, and his father's money. And he worked for Warner Brothers in the cartoon department hmm. uh, with the intention of becoming a, a film director. And his, the deal that he made with his father was that uh, if I don't make it within, it was either one year or two years, I can't recall, then I will come home and I will take over the family business. And um, that was a deal that his father also understood that Alan would, would keep to. Well, at the end of two years, Alan had really done very well. He had become the assistant head of a film studio. He was uh, not yet directing, but on the verge of producing, although he hadn't done any yet. And he called his father, and he said, you know, uh, I've reached the end of the time, the year or two years, so I'm I'm ready to come home. And his father said, "Uh, no, you stay there. I'm going to send you some more money. I want you to stay there. And uh, Pakula, Alan Pakula always said that that was a decisive turning point in his life. He said he knew his father really wanted him to come back, but here was his father being incredibly generous, yeah. saying stay out there and, and do what you want to do. And, of course, his career took off very shortly after that. Mm, that's fantastic. When did his relationship with, with Robert Mulligan uh, begin, that collaboration? It was on uh, the picture Fear Strikes Out. Uh, I don't remember the exact year, but I think it was around 1953 or so. Um, you may have some of the dates there, but I'll flip uh, through. 57. 50. 57, okay. Um, and Pakula was, this was his first uh, time out of the gate as a producer, and he was looking for a director. Mulligan had done a lot of television, and he had seen a lot of his work and was very impressed by it. And... Um, was especially impressed because he saw a production that Mulligan had directed on television with Anthony Perkins in the lead, and he said he found Perkins to be generally a very mannered actor, and um, he had already decided that Perkins was going to play the leading role and had contracted Perkins, in fact, but he was getting very nervous about it. And then he watched this production directed by Mulligan with Perkins playing the lead, and he said all the mannerisms vanished, and he said he was absolutely believable, and he said, well, now that's the director for me. And so he, he went out and hired Robert Mulligan, and so they teamed up and made a number of pictures together. Yeah, uh, and, and, and including To Kill a Mockingbird, correct? Right. Absolutely. And to talk about it, we talk about the perfect films that uh, Pakula has directed, and, and uh, producing To Kill a Mockingbird, which is probably the ultimate time vault movie, of the 20th century for me, um, just a gem of a movie. But but you can see, uh, not so much in that, because I see that as more of a, a, a human story, but you can certainly see traces of it in his 70s work, uh, uh, kind of a political bent. Uh, did he did he always did he always have a sense that they would they would play in, a role in his art? Politics. Uh, poli- you mean? Politics and social commentary. Yeah, I I, I think he must have. Um, certainly most of his films could be called political either in a broad sense or sometimes in a narrow one. He was a political junkie, as uh, several people described him. He was very interested in politics, followed it very closely. And you could go down the list of of many of his films, um, like The Parallax View, All the President's Men, um, uh, certainly Sophie's Choice, presumed innocent, even the Pelican Brief, and say that these are all political films. Uh, even Rollover. Yeah, Rollover would be another good example, yes. I think that Pakula had a distrust of large institutions, and um, many of his films express that distrust, I think, in, in um, uh, focusing on the individual in conflict with large institutions. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it seemed like it seemed that the the films of the seventies. Here I go again. I'm on my seventies soapbox, but <laughs> it, it seemed like the films of the seventies really nurtured that kind of that kind of investigation. Uh, and and you see you see he he thrived particularly in the seventies with those those films. Was there a sense of um, that you got that uh, when 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 that era of filmmaking kind of ended? Uh, what his reaction to that was? Was he at all kind of uh, put off by, by by the Hollywood system and what kind of films were being produced? Well, you know, he he was never really a part of the Hollywood system. Um, he directed almost all his films on the East Coast. He lived in New York. Uh, he had early on in his in his career been in in Hollywood, but he he never really liked it very much. Uh, and part partly why he didn't like it, I think, is that uh, he was concerned about being controlled by film studios, about being told uh, this is the kind of film we want you to do, this is the approach we want you to take. And, mm. uh, he really didn't want that sort of um, pressure. He wanted to make films that were important to him in a personal sense. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that would be my immediate response. Yeah, I mean, he still he still made... He still made the fantastic movies, uh, you know, throughout the the eighty Sophie's Choice and Presumed Innocent. Mm-hmm. It's just that that the era that really catered to, I think, his kinds of films uh, were it was the seventies. And I want to talk about some of these movies just briefly from the seventies. Mm-hmm. And what is what commonly is referred to as his paranoid trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Clute, The Parallax View, and All the President's Men. Right. And he had a he seemed to have a particular affinity for Jane Fonda. Yes, uh, because they worked together. I think three times. Three times. Um, That's right. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that collaboration like? You you, you spoke to to Miss Fonda for the for the book, correct? Yes, I did. Um, well, she was uh, of course enormously impressed by Takula and, and working with him. She said that she is not the kind of actress who can work independently. She needs direction. She said she needs someone to focus her on where she's going and um, give her ideas. And that he was, as far as she was concerned, the ideal director to work with. I think that their their um, work together, their collaboration, really reached a, a peak in Clute. They did make two more pictures together. I think she was very, very good in Comes a Horseman, although the film is not the equal of Clute at all. Right. And then in Rollover, uh, I know that there are some people who are fond of that. I I don't <laughs> I don't think it's a good movie at all. No, it's just it's, it's kind of he- ahead of its time in one sense. It's like for today, that's the only thing I can think of that you could say. Yeah, it was you know you could it could play today almost. Well, that's true. I think there are there are things about it. I mean, you could pick out uh, scenes or moments in the picture that are. Particularly interesting, but I don't think it it worked very well, and neither does Jane Fonda. By the way, she felt that. No, I remember it was panned when it came out. Yeah, yeah. And I remember it was panned horribly. Yeah, but 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 in starting with but starting with Clute, I mean, uh, it was kind of a revolutionary role for 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 a, a female lead at that time, wasn't it? Especially for somebody who was known as Barbarella. <laughs> uh, kind of sex symbol at the time. Yeah, right. Yeah, something very different from her for for her. And um, it really allowed her to break out of the kind of stereotype that she had been in before. And, uh, and of course, she's, she's absolutely brilliant in that picture, yeah. um, which is why he wanted to work with her again and again. And she was, um, I think she's, she's one of our, our very best actresses. You know, I know that she hasn't done much work for the last 30 years or so, but uh, she's really very brilliant and incredibly Smart, I think. Oh, uh, oh, absolutely. And her intelligence just shines through in everything that she, everything that she does. So uh, she was certainly one of his favorite actresses. But then he he had many favorites and worked so well with people like Meryl Streep and um, Liza Minnelli and so many others, um, Jill Clayburgh, Candace Bergen, and so on. Yeah. He was known as a as an actress's director, which I think he was. But I I think that sort of um, in in some sense, is unfair because he also elicited great performances from people like Kevin Klein and Harrison Ford. So he he certainly worked very well with men as well. Yeah, but it's a it's a versatility that that is pretty rare among directors. That 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 he's he's equally good at crafting these terrific original performances for women mm-hmm. as he is for men. Um, in terms of the parallax view, was that well received at the time of its release? And and do you sense that it's kind of resurging somehow? 
Well, let me give you a, a more complicated answer than you might be looking for, but <laughs> all of his early films that are now regarded as classics, uh, Clute would be one, To Kill a Mockingbird would be another, and The Parallax View certainly another, were not really given uh, very good reviews at the time of their original release. Afterwards, uh, critics began changing their minds and saying that Clute was a masterwork. But that's not the way people originally thought about it. Um, and they didn't feel that way in general about the parallax view either. That's true. Yeah. So there's been, there was a real sea change. Um, I what think, caused that? What caused the sea change? Yes. I think the fact that, uh, for one thing, audiences were clearly appreciative of the work and it made critics take a second look. And it may just be the fact that the critics themselves, you know, felt they had to go back and and um, see what made these pictures so appealing. You know, another, this is not a Pakula picture, of course, but uh, a, a similar kind of event happened with Bonnie and Clyde when it came out in the 60s. Right. You know, it got terrible reviews when it was first released, and um, it was considered to be an exploitative movie and... Uh, uh, not one that would have much interest for anybody. But, right. um, of course, it very shortly afterward became known as a masterpiece, and I think it, it, I think it genuinely is a masterpiece. Uh, I agree. Um, what about Taxi Driver? That also was one of those cases that was not widely praised like it is now. Yeah, I guess that's time. true. I really don't recall what the original response to Taxi Driver was, but, you know, you could go back even to... Um, I mentioned Chekhov before as the playwright that uh, Pakula directed when he was in college, but Chekhov's plays, which are now considered among the best plays ever written, mm-hmm. right. uh, I think maybe he is Shakespeare among among playwrights. Right, but right. when his plays were first done in the 1890s, they were just torn apart by the critics because Chekhov was so very different. He was so far ahead of his time, and people That's didn't true. have any understanding of what he was doing. It, it, it seems I discovered the Parallax View a few years ago, and and I, uh, being a film lover, I had no idea it existed. And I I, I I was just taken aback. It was a, just a jewel of a movie, and I said, "Where's this been?" Yeah. Uh, so in my personal universe, it really has it really opened my eyes to to a great new movie, and it got me very excited. Uh, but all the President's Men, it seems that Robert Redford must have been the an ideal collaborator uh, for Pakula. They worked extremely well together. They had their arguments. Uh, Redford was essentially the producer, although he didn't take uh, the credit as producer on the film. And, of course, uh, Pakula was the director. But they collaborated on almost everything, including the script, because um, they really didn't like the original script that had been written for the film. And so they locked themselves in a hotel room for about five or six weeks and rewrote it um, virtually line by line, according to Redford, um, so the, the the script, although it's credited to someone else who won an Academy Award for it, uh, was actually written primarily by um, Redford and Pakula. Yeah. And um, although, as I say, they occasionally had their differences, uh, in general the the um, relationship was a, a really sound one and worked very well for both men. And I think when when you when you first see all the president's men, uh, it's so engaging, and, and I see a lot of it in, in the recent film Zodiac as well. In, in that it, it's it makes the it makes an observation of just people working and oftentimes doing the most mundane kind of activities. It makes that so engaging and, and, and thrilling in a way. Yeah, I think that uh, that's one of the great triumphs of the film. That uh, you would think that people going through call slips at the Library of Congress would be the dullest thing in the world to film, but actually it's an exciting moment. You would think that somebody, a reporter, calling his sources, and all you see is the reporter, you don't even see the source, right. would be um, boring, but it's not at all boring. It is, in fact, very exciting. And a lot of that has to be attributed to Redford. He was He was excellent, I think, in that. I've always felt that Redford has always been underestimated as an actor, but especially so. in that picture, he is—he's really outstanding. I think it's fantastic. And 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 this is the, you mentioned the Library of Congress scene. This is where oftentimes I I've read past reviews and, and they review Pakula's direction as uh, workmanlike, which almost seems like a backhanded insult in a way. Yeah. But yeah. it's because his style isn't isn't uh, doesn't call attention to itself. But there's an enormous amount of style in, in All the President's Men that, that that completely is motivated and driven by character. And that library of Congre- that library scene is a prime example. 
that crane shot that kind of hovers further and further away as they're buried in a, a mound of information there over their heads. And, and, and scenes where they're on the telephone and they have a, just an exceptional split focus. And, and there's so much in that movie to relish for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. And if you started going through it, you can talk about the sound in that picture from yes. the very beginning when the typewriter keys are striking the paper. And there are gunshots mixed in with that. Uh, yeah. And the uh, whips yeah. to make the sound that much more arresting. Um, and these are all, of course, choices that the cooler would make in the editing room. Um, but if you were to characterize his style, I would say it would be a style of restraint uh, in which the director really doesn't get in the way. And you're not so much conscious of the director when you're watching the picture. You're, you're, what you are conscious of is following characters in a, in a plot that's being developed and resolved. Yeah. So I think you, a restraint is probably the, the best word to characterize his approach. What do you think his, his legacy is mm. and will continue to be? Well, uh, good question. The movie business, I think, has changed a lot since he was, he was part of it. Um, I do think that uh, at the time that he was most prominent, um, films were a much more mature medium than television. Uh, and he took advantage of that possibility of working in a mature medium and making uh, mature statements and films. Uh, I think that the movies may not have um, maintained that any longer, and I'm sure I, I don't think that television is any longer to be looked down upon. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some good and serious work being done on television too. So I don't know. I think the jury is still out. Maybe uh, I hope that I hope that. Um, his legacy is that it's possible to direct personal films, and um, also to be a good businessman, and you know to try to bring in a profit for the studio that's distributing the picture. But, but primarily to direct films that are personal to the director, and in which the director has that kind of personal investment. Um, I hope that turns out to be the case, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But the, as, as for me, I mean, he's a. I'm I'm a 34 year old guy from from Florida, and he's he's really enriched my life with his work. And uh, uh, I just appreciate you coming on so much, yes. and and, sh- and sharing your your stories of him. And uh, and thank you so much, sir. Yeah, I'm thank very you glad too. Good to talk to you. Thank you, you too, sir. Sure. That is uh, Jared Brown. His book is Alan J. Pakula, his films and his life. It is available now. Pick it up. Great insights. Uh, we even forgot to mention Harrison Ford does the foreword on the book. That's another collaborator. Uh, of Fakula's. They did two films together, um, Presumed Innocent and The Devil's Own. Speaking of which, our next guest uh, is the screenwriter of The Devil's Own. We'll get, and uh, really a protege of, of Mr. Pakula's, and we'll get his ins- insights too into, into this tremendous artist. Uh, it was good, good to hear from him. It, yes, uh, it was. Um, uh, that was very informative. I also like when they bring up, you know, a lot of these films, you know, we do consider them classics, were not well received by the critics. Yeah. when they first came out. It's always something of um, a shock when you first hear that. Yeah, and you know, it's it's strange because the one that we refer to as the ultimate classic now, uh, which, what, what is the top, top, you know, the AFI, the one top movie ever made? Uh, Citizen Kane, isn't it? Citizen Kane. And contrary to popular opinion, uh, Citizen Kane was praised to the heavens upon its first release. Right. Uh, it was actually one of those cases where Yes, it was ahead of its time, but it was it, it was it was appreciated yeah. at at that time. You could still do that. I mean, because it was su- it's such a new medium then that you could still. And that year that came out, so many great films came out. But yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It was a groundbreaking film in a relatively new um, art form. But yeah, I wonder what that would if that would be how that would be received today. I'm always curious about some of these films, like Lawrence of Arabia, how they would be received today. Yeah, and and maybe it's just my small universe where I just recently in recent years discovered Parallax View. Maybe that's why I, I feel like it's uh, it's it's going through a resurgence of interest. And 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 um, I'll people be are... very honest with you about that movie. We before long before we had cable, I'd watched that on one of this um, our local channels. And God, this must have been the mid late eighties and. I, it really blew me away. I do think that was really that was one of the first films. I, I guess you could say maybe. Well, obviously not the the original Manchurian Candidate, but that and later Winter Kills. It really took right. a fictional a fictional look, but at the Kennedy assassination. 
And well, and, and Venturian itself went through a resurgence, and you you still hear people a lot of people talking about Three Days of the Condor, which Three Days of the Condor is is, is a superb film, um, mm-hmm. and timeless. I, I would have to say. Yeah, like and it's so been many... imitated so much in the last year. There are certain in the last couple of years, there are two movies I can think of that owe a lot to it. But, um, but but you know we talk we talk a lot about '70s cinema, or at least I do. And 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 obviously it's a wealth of such timeless films that came out of the '70s. Right. There's great movies that come out now as well. I, I don't want to say that the only time any good movies ever came out was 30 years ago, but uh, but it was really um, marked by the political, socially conscious films of which Pakula was a leader. Right. Uh, with, with, that, with that paranoid trilogy alone, what they refer to as the paranoid trilogy. I, I mean, he, he, he was it. I mean, he was like the godfather of that, of that genre movie in the 70s. No, he took it to new heights. You could say, you could make the argument that Samuel Fuller was doing it with some of his films, his crime films especially. Actually, a lot of the gangster and a lot of the film noir did uh, um, attack these themes. But Sidney Pollack, I'm not saying, I keep wanting to say Sidney Pollack, forgive me because you brought up Three Days of the Gondor, but um, Alan J. Pakula did, was the first one to really the, comp- the conspiracy theory and put it into a mainstream narrative. Right. And it, and it, and it worked very well. Yeah, and, and uh, All the President's Men is, for me, it's just one of those perfect movies. Oh, uh, well, look, look to it, like Zodiac and also Traffic. Yeah. The influence is seen so much. Yeah, and and yeah, I read interviews with uh, filmmakers like Soderbergh that says, you know, I I was heavily influenced by all the president's men, uh, and and that style that he was referring to earlier, Jared Brown, it's not intrusive, but it it, br- it brings out the most of the the character and the setting and the theme of that story, uh, and that's something that we're lacking today too. We have right. so many so many show off kind of directors, and it, it's it's fun to see all the. The uh, pyrotechnics and that kind of thing, but does it does it serve the story? You know, does it serve the characters? It uh, just depends. I mean, it just depends on your point of view. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you ready to continue this? This is great. yes, yeah. We continue our celebration with David Aaron Cohn, an exceptionally talented screenwriter who regards Alan J. Pakula as his mentor in the film business. In addition to scripting Pakula's last film, The Devil's Own, Mr. Cohen has also written films like V.I. Warshawski, Point of View, Friday Night Lights, fantastic movie, and the television miniseries Five Days to Midnight. It is a great pleasure to welcome David Aaron Cohen to Movie Geeks United. David, are you with us? I am. Hey, glad to be here. Hey, thank you, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell me first, what was your introduction to uh, to Pakula in, in terms of the, the first film of his that really that really took hold of you and had an impact on you? Um, actually, the first uh, movie of Alan's that uh, influenced me quite a bit was uh, was Clute, which I saw. You know, I think I was probably in high school at the time and just went to the movies, and uh, it was one of those movies that that really got me started thinking about film as a, as a career. I just went and I just went, you know, wow, if you can make a movie like that that has that kind of uh, power. And it was so understated, and the performances mm-hmm. were just great. It was just great cinema, you know. And uh, so it was kind of um, a great adventure many, many years later to be walking into his suite at the Four Seasons when he came to... Los Angeles, and he was looking for a writer for this project, for this book that he had optioned called Friday Night Lights. And, um, you know, for, for it's kind of a long story, but I got the opportunity to walk in and audition for that job. He was meeting with maybe six or seven kind of A list writers in Hollywood, and I was, you know, the new kid. And uh, we met, and, you know, I, uh, I, I sort of walked into this hotel room, and Alan, as was his, his practice, I don't know if you know this, everyone's spoken about it, but he used to direct all of his movies in his socks. He didn't wear shoes on the set. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was part of his just, I don't know, there was something about, you know, I've said this a lot about Alan, but he had a kind of childlike quality to him in the best sense of the word, that he was just really curious and, yeah. you know, wide-eyed and and, uh, and comfortable with himself in that level. And here I was in the Four Seasons, and he shuffled in in his socks, and we, we had this... Uh, this meeting, and I kind of pitched my take on what I saw in this material and what kind of a movie it would be, and walked out the door, you know, didn't think I'd ever hear from him again, and uh, about three weeks later, I was in my 
office in the backyard of my house in Venice, and I get this phone call. They just like pass right through. And Alan had this way of talking. He would kind of, he would sort of mumble and, and talk, and he'd be ahead of himself, get ahead of himself in the conversation. And he was like, "So, um, when are you coming to New York?" You know, and I was like, "I didn't even know that I'd gotten the job." You know, that was how it started. <laughs> so uh, about a week later, I was on a plane um, to New York and uh, ended up being one of uh, three scripts that I wrote for him. So. Wow. So, so, but you, the original meeting was for for Friday Night Lights. Absolutely. Yeah. And Friday Night Lights was to be his follow up to The Devil's Own. Um, no, I mean the timing of this is all different, you know, because as it is in the movie business, one movie comes out, you know, can end up coming out much later than the other one. So, right. Friday Night Lights was I first started working on it for Alan back in 1991 or 92. It had a long wow. gestation period. And uh, once I finished that draft, you know, he kind of kept getting caught up in other projects. And I think, to be honest, it was a piece of material that he really liked a lot. And, and again, Alan had a great eye for literary material. You know, right. he did a lot of adaptations and, you know, movies like Sophie's Choice or All the President's Men. And so he saw, you know, the, the possibility and the potential in this material. Whether or not it was really a movie that, you know, he was intending to direct at some point, you know, I, I think the answer to that question is that actually, at the end of the day, he realized that it wasn't, you know, for him. But he was a great producer. You know, that's a lot of things, something that people don't recognize him for so much. And he was a producer for years before he even directed a film. Oh, yeah. Joe we've been, been, we've been discussing those efforts. I mean, you can't get, you can't get better than To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> and I, I, was a, I grew up in Chicago, so I was a White Sox fan, so I remember seeing Fear Strikes Out. Right. Jimmy Pearsall story. Uh, you know, about a major leaguer who, I don't know if you guys talked about it, who has a little bout with mental illness. But, um, yeah, so... So yeah. tell me about that relationship, uh, because you kind of regard him as a, as a mentor to you in, in the business. Uh, yeah, well, what, he really what, gave me my first big break in, in you know, in hiring me. Um, <clears throat> really, I didn't have the sort of credentials or, you know, the list of... Uh, or even scripts to read that were appropriate to that story when he met me. Um, but he had read a spec script that I wrote. You know, at the time I'd already done the I. Warshawski. And, uh, and again, it was just him. He was that kind of person who really, when he met someone and he, he believed in your talent, you know, he was, he was a big broker for people of, of giving them, you know, that opportunity. And um, so that's how, you know, that's really how we got started. And, um, after I finished uh, Friday Night Lights, um, he had then also optioned another book, which uh, I loved, and it was just an adaptation that was really, really challenging with Jonathan Leeson's book, A Gun with Occasional Music. I don't know if you Yes. Oh, I, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it was just a great, you know, it was like sci-fi, noir, you know, detective. It had all the genres kind of effects. It was a really challenging piece of work, but it was... Yes, it is. Yeah. And, you know, I wrote it. I did a couple of drafts for Alan. Um, and, again, in that process, that, that's really of going through, you know, writing two scripts like that with him, somebody who was, who was really actively mentoring me, because in working on a script with him, you, know, you just had that opportunity to, um, to go to work, you know, to roll up your sleeves and go to work. And what that meant in, in, in Alan's terms were I would fly out to New York and we would schedule these sessions where I would sit in his offices in New York and uh, and we would just brainstorm, you know, and it was a wonderful, wonderful process with him. I think one of the things that he really taught me was how to create a space where you could, where all the ideas were welcome. You know what I mean? It didn't matter how silly they were or how stupid or how outrageous or how banal, whatever it was, there was no idea that wasn't welcomed in that space, you know, and uh, it really helped me to learn how to break story. Um, and it's not something you necessarily learn in a lot of other places in the film world. In terms of story, uh, story construction, and working with him on that, were, were there elements that he that he gravitated to, and, 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 and some things that he he wanted you to try to avoid at all costs? Um, you know, well, I'm thinking... I think Alan, in many ways, he was a classicist. You know, he he really uh, I don't know, again I don't know you know what else you guys have covered in the interview, but he had this incredible understanding I think of of film grammar. When you watch yeah. him as a director, when you watch his work, it's just, you know, you just, 
you just marvel at the shot selection, at the places where he puts the camera, at the way, the economy of means, you know, right. the way that he really communicates. And I think if you think about it, if you think about film grammar and using each shot, medium, close, wide, you know, as parts of speech, you see also, because Alan was a writer also, you know, he really rewrote a lot of his own stuff. He did the script for Sophie's Choice, you know. Um, and so he, he thought like a writer in many ways. And when you work with him on a script, it would also just be about really honing in and, and just telling the essentials, you know, in any scene. And uh, one of the things that I always, I, I pass that on to other writer friends of mine, and even to my own uh, children now who, you know, are writing their papers for, for school, is that he would write in the margins, he would, you know, he would, he would have his pen and he would write in the margins uh, on a piece of dialogue or a piece of whatever, NGE which was not good enough, you know. It was just it was a great kind of, it was an Allen thing, because he didn't want to, you know, he wasn't big on confrontation, you know, he wasn't, right, big on, right. he wasn't like a scream or anything like that, but it was the way that he would push you to do your best. You know, you'd look at it, and afterwards I would see that NGE, and I'd go, you know what, he's absolutely right. It's okay, but it's just not good enough. Right. So, so did you have an opportunity to speak to him about his own work and, and get a sense of what he felt about, uh, about his, his previous work? Um, you know, with Alan, when you talk about his own work, he was more, he loved, he loved, he was a great storyteller too. And he would tell, you know, all the stories about this production and, you know, that movie star and, you know, right. what happened. He was a great gossip too, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> he loved to gossip, Alan. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we didn't get, I mean, there were certain things that, um, uh, you know, that he would tell us about, like one of the things was how. He shot Parallax View really without a script, like that was ready before they went into production. Uh. And it was very much kind of guerrilla filmmaking in that sense. And, uh, you know, I remember hearing that and then thinking about when I saw that movie, because I think it's one of the great conspiracy films of all time. I do too. I do too. Absolutely. You know, and really underappreciated movie. I mean, it's just so, it was so groundbreaking in so many ways. I couldn't agree more. So, um, So I remember thinking about that and going, you know, to be able to pull that off, and to have that kind of vision and to do it on the run, you know, the way they were doing them in the 70s, kind of running through New York City and other parts of uh, the country. It's just uh, I, I, my hat, you know, absolutely off to him about that. Do you get a sense of, uh, of what he – this might be too broad of a question because mm-hmm. there are so many versatile films in his resume – but of what he wanted to say or what he wanted to express with his work? Um. Good question. Well, the themes that kind of that, that that kind of consumed him. Yeah, I think ultimately Alan was very much, you know, he was a humanist. You know, he really believed in um, both the potential and the abilities of human beings to to shape their own world. You know, and if you look at some of the stories that he told that I think resonated the most, they really got down to you know, how each of these characters, what kind of choices they made in their lives. Alan was not a guy who was, you know, he wasn't, uh, there, was, there was no big religious side to him or that, just the opposite. You know, he came out of New York, the sort of New York intellectual world, you know, where psychoanalysis was a very big item. Right. And people's psychological motives uh, were really the things that consumed him. And yeah. he was a great observer of people in that sense. So I think if I, if you look at his movies, you look at the the, the things that really were active uh, in the storytelling. They are about you know why human beings make the choices they do, understanding to the depths of you know your ability as a storyteller and putting it up on the screen, the kind of choices they made. You know, obviously, with that word, Sophie's Choice comes to mind because it was yeah. that kind of a story. But even in some of the other movies, you know with, with uh, Jane Fonda and, and, and that whole relationship and Clute and what she's looking to choose and not choose and the moral choices of the politicians in Parallax View. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you, if you look at Devil's Own, it's really a movie also about, you know, those kind of choices. You know, are you making that choice, that sort of human choice of relationship versus the choice of politics, you know, for, for let's say, Brad Pitt's character and, you know, as, a, as an IRA terrorist. So I think you just... Uh, he really cared deeply about people and about his characters, and I think it shows in the work that he did on the screen. 
I definitely want to get to the devil's own, uh, but I asked this of the previous guest, um, uh, Mr. Pakula's biographer, Jared Brown. Uh, if you know he, his films in the seventies, uh, I mean, the, those were the types of movies that audiences kind of uh, ran to in the seventies. The, the the social consciousness uh, films. Sure. And then uh, we've kind of strayed away from that. Did you get a sense from him of what he thought about uh, the direction movies were taking after the seventies? Um, you know, I think he knew that that age had passed in its own way, and that, and, and I say it passed not in the sense that people aren't making you know important groundbreaking guerrilla films uh, nowadays. It's just uh, I think maybe more accurately for himself that age had passed. He was gonna you know, he wasn't gonna go out and do movies on that level. He was gonna work very much within the studio system. Yeah, and you know, and he had a really good arrangement, I think, with the studio system until, like, for so many people, you know, the names changed and were replaced by the conglomerates and the multinationals, and then all of a sudden, you know, the landscape was different. You know, yeah. and then he found himself more able to make movies like Pelican Brief or Devil's Own. Um, you know, as sort of bigger pieces of popular entertainment. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I yeah. think, you know, I, I can tell one story that might, you know, reveal a little bit about that, and that was there was a time when I was coming out to New York, we were working on, I'm trying to think, I think it was probably working on at the time on the script for Gun with Occasional Music, and um, he was going into pre-production on a movie. It was um, Consenting Adults. Yes. Right? And again, at best, you know, it was a B movie. I mean, just just from the get-go, you know, right. kind of what it was. And I just asked him, I said, Alan, you know, you can really, it's not like you need the money. You know, you could choose whatever. You know, why are you making this movie right now? And, and his answer, it really stayed with me. He said, you know what, I just am practicing my craft. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. Interesting, me, okay. You know, that was a great answer. Because it was like, so what if, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be, the Oscar movie or wasn't going to be whatever, he was a craftsman. He was a consummate craftsman. And the opportunity to practice, you know, uh, was something uh, that he relished. And, and, you know, that was something he got up in the morning to do. Absolutely. And, and talk about a director that loves actors. He got to practice his craft with, with Kevin Spacey and Kevin Klein and Forrest Whitaker. And, you know, it's a... Sure, it, Merrill. Yeah, you know, yeah. Redford and all those guys. Yeah, he was uh, a great... Uh, Director of movie stars, he did. Did you did you observe him on the set with with actors, and what, what was that collaboration like? Um, you know, I had less of an experience of him on the set with actors, and more of an experience with him in the rooms before, because the the whole experience with Devil's Own was one of intense actor issues. Right, that's right. So, um, you know, I was at the time. Uh, I ended up collaborating with uh, Vincent Patrick uh, on that script. And we were brought in. I was came to do a sort of page one rewrite of a movie that was already in pre production. Mm. How yeah. sorry. That must have been stressful. It was very stressful, but you know, the good news was that at first I thought I was doing it myself, and then they said, "No, no, you, <laughs> there's too much work. You have to partner with someone." And I had never really collaborated before as a writer, and uh, they brought Vince in, and uh, we just became great, great friends, and you know, we really held on to each other in the stressful uh, events of the next four or five months of getting that movie made. But, uh, and it was also incredibly fun and entertaining and, you know, a zillion stories, some of which I can't repeat. But, um, oh, that's a <laughs> shame. I was hoping you, you could. You, you could say, you could, this is Uncensored Radio. You could say whatever you'd like on yeah, the Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was a real, uh, it was a real uh, eye-opening experience to see, you know, Alan work in the rooms because the way that it worked was, um, you know, this was a movie that had been originally set up with Brad Pitt. You know, it was like a one-hander. He was like the main star, that kind of thing. And then at some point, he had sent a script out, or somebody in his company had sent a script out to Harrison, thinking that he would play this part, you know, of the New York City cop. And when the answer came back, yes, you know, this was at the time, it was Columbia, it was Peter Goober, those guys, and... And all of a sudden, they got, you know, they, they just, it was just so irresistible to the studios, the idea that they could have Brad Pitt, who at the time was, you know, the youngest 
huge movie star on the rise. Kind of every one of his movies had opened incredibly well. Yeah. And you know, and here was Harrison, you know, who was who was Harrison. And uh and then they immediately all of a sudden made the deal and there was Harrison as the guy who was gone out to to play the secondary role, signing the deal and, you know, getting paid twenty million dollars to play uh his part. And so the script all of a sudden needed some serious, you know, writing. Right. Because they were going to be damned if they were going to pay Harrison twenty million dollars to play this cop who like drops his gun in the middle of a chase, and you know he was kind of a. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. So Wait. that's what happened. So so Kevin Jarrow had written the original script, um, kind of wasn't going to move from where he had originally done it to, and uh, and Alan called me up. He said, you know, come to New York and let's see if we can go to work on this. And, uh, was was he? Did you get a sense that he was satisfied with the final product of of the Devil's Own, Pakula? The way that it came out, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was proud of it, and I'm proud of it too. I think it's you know, if you if you watch it again, it's it's a movie that, you know, the story sort of off screen took over more for what was actually happening on screen, um, in terms yes. of people's perception of the film. Right. But when it came out, I remember just reading one of the reviews, it was like the Time Magazine review, was, you know, for all the talk about what happened, da 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 you know, this is like a really good piece of filmmaking, you know, it was just, yeah. uh, it was really well done in the same way that, you know, Alan was just a professional like that, and he got the good performances, and, you know, it was a difficult challenge just to write a, a movie in which you have two more or less equal main parts. It, it defies all the logic of, you know, conventional storytelling. Yes. Um, so that was a challenge. And uh, and then it was also a challenge, you know, behind the scenes because we had, you know, Harrison kind of coming in and we got hired, Vince and I, really to rework the script so that it would give his part, make his part, you know, much, much bigger. And ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, that really irked Brad, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, what happened. So all of a sudden it became a kind of a competition where we were perceived as, you know, Harrison's writers, and then we got really close to uh, to them, you know, the, the production, the start date, and it was kind of like, I remember the start, it was one of those moments that was like, you know, when they have the, the, they all go into the room to elect the next pope and you wait for the smoke to come out? Right, right. That was this meeting, you know. <laughs> It was Harrison, Brad, Alan, and uh, Larry Gordon kind of all sitting in a room and figuring out if they were going to actually make this or not. And this was after, you know, everybody had already been uh, on salary for weeks and weeks and weeks, you know. Yeah. I mean, the DPs and the, everybody. And, and basically what, what Vinny and I would do is that every night we would write pages, and the minute that we would write those pages, like five or six pages, they would get taken down to the production. Then they would get distributed. Then, the, then the, you know, everybody in the production design, everyone figured out, okay, because they were trying to figure out where the movie was going. This is like November when they're right. talking about shooting in January, you know. And we never really got to the place where we got to kind of write the entire draft before they started shooting. Mm. We were doing like five pages at a time, another five, okay, we got through act one, we got through half, you know, and we, and then we kept revising the other things. And we eventually got them all done, but it was, you know, it was very, um, very stressful. <laughs> I bet, I bet. And, and But at the same time, I mean, Harrison Ford, this was the second movie he did with Pakula, and and that the first, Presumed Innocent, I think, uh, among his two or three best performances. Ever. Oh, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought Harrison yes. did a great job in Devil's Own. I thought they both were good, to be honest. Yes, they are fantastic in Devil's you know? Own, absolutely. And, and uh, Harrison but, was so much fun to work with, and just, uh, he really was, you know, he's, he's one of the funniest guys in the world when you meet him. He's an <laughs> incredible sense of humor, incredible sense of humor. It's just so funny that he, you know, he spent a career playing guys who, well, that's not true. If you if you look at the Indiana Jones movies. Oh, the, it, it works because of the humor. Yeah. 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 Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. It, when you're, it, Alan would have been uh, going on 80 uh, this year. Yeah. Uh, do, yeah do you ever look around? Yeah, because he was 69, I think, when he died. And, and yeah. Was, I mean, when 97 we did Devil's Own. So right. Like, yeah. Do, do you think about what his uh, what kind of films that he'd be making today? I know that Jerry and I were were talking about it, we we're theorizing, and I, I thought, you know, there's a property. It's called Against All Enemies. And it's a, Richard it, Clark's book. Yeah, and I thought, man, that would have that would have been Pakula's thing. That would have mm -hmm. been. Yeah, yeah. You know, we used to joke because 
Alan's parents, you know, lived to be like 100 and 101, you know. Oh, wow. And we were just always laughing about, you know, how long he was going to be able to keep working because he had incredible energy. I mean, mm-hmm. I have to tell you, I was the youngest guy on that particular set, you know, of, of, of Devil's Own in terms of like, because Vince is an older and Larry, Larry Gordon and, you know, Alan at the time was maybe, I don't know, 60 six or seven, something like that. Right. And he would just work us under the table, you know? Uh, oh, I have a feeling he would have worked till the end. Yeah. What's that? He would have worked like John Huston, and, and he would have worked till the very end. He would have been movies. making movies. I mean, he would have made ten more movies. Yeah, I know? believe that. Absolutely. I mean, he would, it was just amazing. We'd be working on script pages, you know, we'd have meetings on it, like after dinner, <laughs> you know, and this is already when they started production. And he would get up, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock. He'd be out there on the set in his socks, you know, <laughs> ready to go. And I just was like, you know, I used to go, how do you do it, you know? <laughs> like, I wish, you know, I'm hoping that when I'm 67 years old, I can be doing the, those 20-hour days, doing something that I love. And I think that's exactly the, the reason why, because he just loved what he did. 